President Bush and King Abdullah of Jordan. You can see that news briefing in its entirety later today on C-SPAN. This is a live picture from the House Rayburn Office Building where today the House Government Reform Committee is looking at government, the Government Performance and Results Act passed a decade ago. That law was intended to make the government more efficient and accountable by linking an agency's budget to its performance. Witnesses include former House Majority Leader Dick Armey, who's on your screen, and U.S. Comptroller General David Walker. The hearing just got underway, and this is live from Capitol Hill. Eighty-four, when I was elected, between that time of my election and the time that I was actually sworn in, I was given the opportunity to elect which committees on which I would like to serve, and this was a committee of choice for me. And uh, with my good fortune was that I was selected to serve on this committee, which I thought was going to be a delightful experience until I came to Washington and met the chairman, Mr. Brooks who I remember with great grand fondness. Uh, Jack Brooks was a tough fella, but a decent guy. Uh, we developed a good relationship over the years. He used the committee oftentimes to discipline the various agencies of this government. And in a manner not always uh, toward the objective of improving their performance with respect to the enactment of the law, but perhaps with respect to the partisan difference between the uh, Democrat majority in the Congress at that time and the Republican president. Uh, so that we saw uh, all those years ago a different role for the committee relative to uh, its oversight responsibilities, a different set of philosophy. That changed through the time, through through the years, and I think it's important for us to note that the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993 was passed into law by a Democrat-controlled Congress uh, at a time when a Democrat was in the White House. So clearly, there was no purpose of Congress at that time to enact legislation that would allow them to exercise a political leverage over the administration. I think we can all recognize the intent of Congress at that time was to give this tool, this committee in particular, but the Congress in general, a set of tools and a set of standards by which they could encourage each and every agency of this government to implement the law of the land. And. Uh, to do so in a manner that uh, reflects the will of Congress as the law was written. Uh, this is the effort that we've taken, this committee has taken. Let me also mention, if I might digress for a quick moment, uh, I do have a formal uh, statement and I would like to have it in the record. It's all in the record, but it's already done. And uh, to my good fortune in 1994, the majority status of the Congress changed and I had the privilege of becoming majority leader and within that context of my duties as majority leader, I accepted the role of, uh, of coordinating oversight activities. Uh, it was a role that I took with a great deal of enthusiasm. I had said then and I, can, and I will say now that Congress can every year do more to affect the well-being of its children and their future with effective oversight than they can by passing new legislation. Oversight is a tough business. It's a business that is often met with resistance, but it is the necessary business of taking that legislation and making it work for the people through the agencies that are charged with the responsibility of the enforcement. I think uh, GIPRA, uh, the Government Performance and Results Act, focused on a uh, cultural problem that affected many of our agencies where they had an emphasis on process. One must understand that when legislation is written, it is oftentimes written in a manner that is lax enough to give the agencies a great latitude in finding their own direction. And uh, 
And uh, to some extent, the agency will act as if it were water and take the path of least resistance. Uh, that's not necessarily oftentimes what the law asks. It may ask us to do what is in fact a more difficult job with a greater degree of rigor, uh, discipline, and looking for different results. So to pass a piece of legislation that gives Congress a sense of oversight, authority, and duty to, what should I say, encourage the agencies to focus on results, to measure their performance by results, rather than to st stay enmeshed in the comforts of a focus on process, is an important piece of legislation. I have to say, from my experience, the United States House of Representatives since 1993 has taken GIPRA seriously, this committee in particular. I would like to take a moment to pay my respects to former Congressman Steve Horn, who served on this committee, and I think may have set a standard in diligence and commitment in his personal chairmanship, subcommittee chairmanship with respect to the, his pursuit of this committee. And I know from my many conversations with Steve and my own experience, if I may, that the GAO has always been an agency of this government that's understood GIPRA, worked hard, and provided good information and support to the efforts of the House. After 10 years, we want to assess what progress is made. 10 years is not a great deal of time to affect a change in culture. And, uh, and I think within that context, we should say, I believe we're making progress. Uh, agencies who have many times been comfortable consoling themselves by measuring their past year's uh, activities by process notations are learning that they can no longer do that and must ju juxtapose their activities against the results that were designed uh, and hoped for in the legislation. The reports are painfully made and often resisted. But this committee, I believe, if it stays committed to the full and comprehensive uh, enactment of GIPRA, as I believe it has, can do a great deal to cause each and every agency of the government to exercise their responsibility to the, enact the enforcement of the law as enacted by Congress in a manner that gets better results for the American people. So I, let me just uh, summarize by saying I'm I'm pleased we passed the law. I'm pleased with the efforts that have been made, particularly in the House of Representatives and even more particularly in this committee, supported by the GAO. I'm encouraged by the responsiveness of agencies. You're actually asking agencies to change their behavior in a manner that takes them from less comfortable, or I'm from, from more comfortable, uh, to more rigorous patterns of activity and success me uh, measurement. The agencies are doing exactly what one would predict. They are dragging their feet. They are hoping it'll go away. But in the end, with constant encouragement, they will learn these new skill sets and we will serve our nation's children better, as I said, through good oversight than we could have done by making a new law. So thank, thank you for letting uh, me be here. Uh, Mr. Leader, thank you very much for being here today. It's great to have you and we'll have a lively discussion on the questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, thanks for being here. Right. Mr. Chairman, um, the 1993, the 1993 Results Act introduced the concept of performance management to government. This important law required strategic and performance planning it required agencies to set annual goals and then report annually on the extent to which they were achieving their goals. The promise of the Results Act was a government that managed for results. That was the promise. I think 
though, that the reality of the Results Act today is a government that rarely uses performance information to manage programs or make decisions on how to improve performance. In response to this state of affairs, agencies and OMB together have set out to ask how individual programs, more targeted than asking that question about overall agencies, but asking how individual programs are performing. Are they effective? Are they well managed? If not, how might we work with Congress to improve program performance? The administration created the Program Assessment Rating Tool, referred to as the PART, which is a consistent, objective and transparent method of evaluating a program's purpose and design, its management, and its results. It assesses the extent to which the agency is managing for results and maximizing the program's performance, which are key requirements of the Results Act. We're analyzing 20 percent of the government's programs each year. We will part these programs at this rate, we will part, we've turned this into a verb, we will part all the programs in the federal government in a five-year period of time. We thought it wise to allow this much time to properly assess and reassess all the federal programs. And maybe more importantly, to allow this much time to change the way the executive and congressional branches address the issue of performance. As Congressman Army talked about, we have to change the culture of this place. I believe that five years from now, the federal government will be managing for results. We can make this happen. Executive branch leadership will be routinely asking whether the programs it administers are effective and efficient and doing what they were intended to do. If they aren't, the executive branch will be looking for ways to improve, working closely with Congress to do so. The executive branch will also be able to assess the programs administered throughout the government, find out which ones work best, and share and supply best practices among them. We will also have a better picture of overall agency performance based on the sum of part evaluations. I also believe that Congress will be using performance information, program performance information, as part of their oversight considerations, insisting that program performance improve throughout government. I expect agencies will be asked why the programs haven't improved. Congress will be working with the executive branch to develop and implement remedies to address poor program performance. I expect this committee in particular will be looking across government at what's working and what's not, and appropriators will be focusing resources on what is working. We are all working to earn the trust of the American people every day. One way to do this is to focus constantly on whether we are doing what we set out to do. We're going to have to work at this. Managing for results is still a new way of thinking for the federal government. We are working with Congress and agencies today, as we speak, to determine the best way to show what performance we achieved for the money we spent last year and the performance we can expect for the money we are requesting for next year. This is what managing for, for results is all about. It is not easy, but it is doable. And because we are managing in times of continued budgetary restraints, it is necessary. This will happen. We will bring about this historic change in government management together, the executive branch and Congress, and in doing so, I believe, realize the full promise of the Results Act. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Walker, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for continuing to hold this hearing today. Uh, I think this is a very important topic, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to continue to uh, hold it, even though others aren't here today. Also, let me say at the outset, it is a privilege to be here with former Majority Leader uh, Dick Armey. Uh, he was the champion of GIPRA. There's absolutely no question about it. And I totally acknowledge as well that Steve Horn, former Congressman Steve Horn, was the champion of oversight with regard to this area. And I'm also pleased to be here with uh, Clay Johnson and with Pat McGinnis. Clay clearly has responsibility for the President's management agenda as well as the park. Uh, and this administration is taking uh, GIPRA very seriously, uh, and real progress is being made, and I'd like to commend them for that. But if I can, Mr. Chairman, since you put the entire statement in the record, a few highlights. As has been noted, this is the 10-year anniversary. It's also, interestingly, the 25th anniversary of the IG Act and the 25th anniversary of the last Civil Service Reform Act. And so those are two areas that, separate and distinct from today, hopefully will get some attention 
uh, during this Congress. I think it's important to note that uh, GEPR was about strategic planning, but also annual performance planning and reporting. Candidly, initially, people didn't take it very seriously in the executive branch. Initially, it was an annual paperwork exercise that people went through uh, and that did not have very outcome-based measures for performance, uh, but that has changed considerably over the last several years, uh, not only because of congressional interest, in particular this committee, uh, in particular Steve Horn's subcommittee, uh, but also there are other good government groups, such as the Council of Excellence in Government. Of course, GAO has been and will remain on the case. But furthermore, they've got the, the Association of Government Accountants who give annual awards for excellence in reporting, and the Mercatus Center, which is part of George Mason University, ranks performance and accountability reports every year uh, and, and what kind of progress there, that's being made. So based upon our work and based upon the work of these other uh, entities, I think it's clear to say that progress has been been, is being made, that the executive branch is taking this seriously. I might note that probably two of the uh, three of the top agencies in this area are the Transportation Department, the Social Security Administration, the Labor Department, the executive branch. Three of the laggards in this area, based upon our work and the work of others, the Defense Department, Health and Human Services, and the Energy Department. I might also uh, say that GAO, GAO, as you know, Mr. Chairman, is leading by example in many areas. I might note that we were ranked number one in the federal government by the Mercatus Center. We were, received the award of excellence from AGA. Uh, but more importantly, it's not just your reporting and your planning, it's what results you actually achieve. And I think we have to focus on that. It's not just the paperwork, it's not just the processes, it's what results are actually being achieved. I think it's important that more steps being take, be taken to link resources to results, to reward people who are doing a good job, and to have consequences for people who are not. Uh, the part is a positive step in this regard. I think it's important to link institutional performance measures with individual performance measurement reward systems. In most federal agencies, that has not been done. It's important to have a government-wide performance plan, which we don't have one right now. It's also important to focus on the horizontal dimension of government rather than just the vertical dimension, because there are many programs, policies that are executed by many different departments and agencies, and we need to be able to minimize duplication, overlap, inconsistency, if you will. I note in my testimony the need for a set of key national indicators that could help frame the overall government-wide performance plan and cascade down to departments and agencies, the need to consider chief operating officers or chief management officials and selected departments and agencies to really make this come alive and to deal with the transformation effort the Majority Leader Army talked about. And candidly, Mr. Chairman, I would say that the executive branch right now, in the tradition of Steve Horn, who gave grades, and in respect for him, I would say the executive grant, grant branch is, uh, is a B or better in taking this seriously and making progress. Uh, they're good. There are differences. Some are better than others, but they're taking it seriously. Candidly, other than this committee, Mr. Chairman, the Congress has a long way to go. I think one of the things that has to happen is Congress has to use this information more for oversight, for authorization, and for appropriations. We see very little evidence, other than this committee, we see very little evidence that Congress is using this information in a meaningful way. People that are doing a good job should be rewarded. People that aren't should be held accountable. And if they can't improve after a period of time, there have to be consequences, and to date, Frankly, there haven't been. I mean, some of the agencies that are doing the poorest in this area get the most resources and the most flexibility, and something's wrong with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's going to generate some questions. I appreciate that. Uh, and Pat McGinnis is here. Pat, thanks. Uh, you made it through the heavy traffic. I'm just thank kidding. You. Uh, would you rise yeah, with me? Yeah, the heavy traffic. It was would, really. <laughs> would you uh, rise with me and raise your right hand? Yes, Tell me where the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thanks for being with us this morning, and we appreciate all that your organization has done and look forward to your perspective on this. Thank you very much. And I also want to um, thank Congressman Army for his leadership on this issue. Um, when you talk about the Congress's lack of interest, your leadership really stands out over the years, and um, I hope that will be a, a legacy that will come alive even more. Um, and thank you, Mr. Davis, for focusing on how we're doing with the Government Performance and Results Act, and, and stepping back to think about how it might be improved. 
as you know, and everyone here um, who we've worked with, the Council for Excellence in Government is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and we have two goals improving the performance of government um, and improving the public's trust and participation in government. Those two goals are intimately related and both are quite connected to the Government Performance and Results Act. Um, I do not think that the potential, the intent of this act has yet been fully realized, although a lot of progress has been made. And um, when you read the statute, this actually this probably should get an award for one of the most readable statutes ever enacted because it makes so much sense. I mean, it really lays out a common sense way of approaching goal setting, management, and accountability. Um, it, it, if it does realize its potential, it's not only a tool for managers and funders, but also a tool for the American people to hold their uh, government accountable. So the stakes are high here and making it work is very important. The, the law was enacted. There was a, a, a very much a phased approach to implementing it, and that made a lot of sense in terms of changing the culture, changing the practice. But um, unfortunately, I don't think it has been accompanied by strong enough leadership either in the executive branch or outside this committee in the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs um, in, in the Congress um, especially in the authorizing appropriation and tax writing committees. We just have not seen this embraced as a valuable tool to make decisions about program design and funding. So on a government-wide basis, and uh, the Controller General has, has noted some of the agencies that have done a terrific job with their strategic planning, but if you look at, at it government-wide, we, we have not achieved um, the potential by any means. I want to say a word about the President's management agenda and the, uh, the part because I think that uh, this reflects a real seriousness by this administration about not only um, setting goals but measuring performance and even more importantly connecting that measurement of performance to budget decisions. I mean, that's where, you can, that's where you see the seriousness of this, in the fact that budget and performance integration is at the center of the President's management agenda. And then when you look at the part, uh, which came along a year later, um, and you see, again, seriousness and commitment to looking at how these programs are doing, what is measurable, where there are gaps in the data, and that's actually a pretty big problem with making this work in the long run, and that needs to be attended to. So we do see a seriousness in the executive branch, but I think um, the, in the Congress, we have not yet seen that, except in a few very selected areas. And, and if you ask me what the biggest challenge is now, I would probably point in that direction in terms of leadership and taking this seriously. This year, for the first time, the Reports Consolidation Act requires agencies to combine their financial reports with performance reports. And this is an amazing opportunity to begin to present to the Congress and the public a meaningful picture of what their tax dollars are being spent mm. for and to explain performance and results in an accessible way. Um, so that is an opportunity that we need to take advantage of through this GPRA uh, framework. As the owners of government, the American people deserve to receive an understandable accounting. And we, they're not receiving that at this point in an, in an, under, uh, an understandable, accessible way. Um, let me make some suggestions um, about either improving the statute. Some of the suggestions I'm going to make will require statutory change. Um, there are other suggestions that could be done without statutory change, but they do require a change in culture, a commitment that is impossible to legislate. But um, I think working together, the executive branch, the Congress, and many of the other organizations that David Walker mentioned could make this a reality. 
One suggestion is that you consider shifting the strategic plan cycle from every three years to every four years to conform to the presidential terms. The plan uh, should be required at the same time the first full budget is released in February of the year following inauguration. All agencies should have to produce new strategic plans that are consistent with the new president's policies and budget. Um, also, we suggest requiring the program goals, measures, and performance data reported in the plans and performance reports to be consistent with those in the president's budget. Um, and then addressing the Congress, uh, and this requires, I believe, rule changes or at least changes in practice. <coughs> we would suggest that uh, each Appropriation Act specify the goals, measures, and performance data it's based on and identify the gaps and the need for additional information. Um, this would create a constructive conversation on these key issues in the funding process. And similarly, we would suggest that every significant program authorization, tax expenditure provision, and mandatory spending provision specify the goals and performance measures expected to be used to judge whether statutory purposes are being achieved. Um, there um, also we would, and this is a really important point in our view, the absence of sufficient rigorous evaluation of what approaches in government programs are actually working to produce results. Um, the uh, the uh, Government Performance and Results Act does mention evaluation and requires a listing in the plans and reports of evaluations that are scheduled or underway, but I think it might make sense to go a little further than that and, in fact, require every large-scale authorization, tax expenditure, and mandatory spending provision to include funding for long-term rigorous evaluation of results. Um, in many cases where programs are not working well in the federal government, it's not because they aren't intended for the right purposes or for the right audiences. It's because we simply don't know what approach works better than another approach because we haven't evaluated it rigorously. And you all are familiar with a, an example of that in the D.A.R.E. program, which has been one of the most popular um, uh, drug abuse education programs across the country uh, for years. And uh, once it was rigorously evaluated, guess what? We found out that it didn't really make any difference. And so that program is being redesigned and changed. It's not that you wouldn't fund that effort, it's that you would want to fund an approach that would actually work. So investing in evaluation and um, holding uh, the, des the program designers and fund funders accountable for that is really uh, important. Every Appropriation Act should have to provide an annual amount for such evaluation consistent with an assessment of what the particular program needs are. Um, these studies are expensive, they're complicated, and they're time consuming. And uh, as you know, they're often resisted by program advocates because sometimes it's tough to find out that the, the uh, approach that you've been advocating doesn't really work. But this is a serious issue, and, and it really is at the heart of trust in government. Um, the people around the country are seeing huge amounts of money spent on programs for purposes that they agree with, but I think we are not seeing the results, um, the return on that investment, and we need to understand that better. Um, also, we would suggest requiring the annual integrated uh, performance and financial reports, uh, to, again, not only to list the evaluations, but to report the status of the evaluations for each goal and how those findings are used to assess programs in meeting the goals and how program direction has changed as a result of that. Um, another suggestion we would make relates to something that David Walker said, and that is taking a cross-cutting look at how programs together that uh, are intended, uh, that have similar purposes, are performing. So we would suggest requiring that strategic and annual plans and performance reports that address similar programs in multiple agencies 
be developed collaboratively by those agencies, uh, identifying cumulative effect and spotlighting the overlap and unproductive d duplication. Um, and where appropriate, it would make sense to also require the plans and reports to specify how related state and local government and private and nonprofit sector activity are taken mm -hmm. into account by these programs. Mm -hmm. Again, it's hard to legislate changes in thinking and many changes in commitment and behavior, but um, GPRA is an essential and important framework for effective planning and management, and it's also essential for the public to figure out what government's doing and how well it's doing. So we appreciate your leadership and look forward to working with you to make this more robust and powerful. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Representative Platts, who uh, chairs a subcommittee with jurisdiction over this. I just want to thank his staff uh, for helping us set this hearing up today, and I know we'll want you to come before him again. And I, I don't think we can talk about these issues too much. Uh, and judging from the testimony here, we need a greater awareness in Congress and among the public about what valuable tools they can, can be, if, be if, if they're employed properly. I think John F. Kennedy said that we campaign in poetry and we govern in prose. And we are today talking about the pros of governance, uh, the, the, uh, the footnotes, the details, uh, the decimal points that can make or break uh, programs. Uh, you know, if good intentions and goodwill and, and uh, dollars could solve our problems, we would have solved them a long time ago. But public policy are very tough. And it's like the D.A.R.E. program and all the T-shirts and the hats and everything that was handed out. I was there at a lot of the rallies. Uh, if they're not working, it's up to us sometimes to have an honest evaluation even to stand up to interest groups who have vested interest in, in old programs and, and take an honest appraisal of what w works. Um, we've had this problem with the District of Columbia Schools last week. Uh, Mr. Army, you for years had championed a voucher uh, program, and I've been a reluctant supporter. Uh, we passed it again in the House this year and have received surprising support from people like Senator Lieberman and Senator Feinstein of the Senate who said, look, we, are, we believe in public schools first, but the programs aren't working. We need to look at new things. And it's hard sometimes getting through interest groups and everything else to have an honest appraisal. But that's what GIPRA is designed to do. I'm touched by the fact that I think everyone touched on their testimony, the difficulty between the awareness of certainly of this committee who has oversight on this, but are able to transform results to the Appropriations Committee and other committees in Congress where we can probably have the most effect. I think one of the difficulties of that is the, is the role that interest groups and local constituencies pay in terms uh, of, of uh, getting government's largesse humped on their programs and the difficulty we have sometimes in sorting through that uh, for the taxpayer's benefit. So I've got a lot of questions uh, I want to uh, move through. I just one other quick anecdote is when Rudy Giuliani got elected mayor of New York, he'd hold these town meetings throughout the city. And the number one request he'd get at these town meetings is for stop signs through neighborhoods, people running traffic and what this did to the old people, the elderly and the kids and everybody else. And, and he'd go back to Gracie Mansion and he'd dictate a memo and they'd come out and they'd do the engineering uh, studies to see if it met the international traffic warrants for signage. And of course, they never got a stop sign. He'd go back the next year and they'd say, where's the stop sign, Rudy? So he, he finally got the he finally got the joke, and he'd go out there and he would load his trunk up with stop signs in his car, and they'd talk about a stop sign and the need for it in detail, and he'd pull the stop sign out there and give it to him. It's a difference sometimes between uh, process-oriented government, which very difficult to get anything done, and results-oriented uh, uh, government. Um, the difference between building a thoroughbred and getting a camel. And uh, there's, of course, a need for process in government, for openness, uh, for transparency. These are the things we rely on government to do. And by its nature, uh, we're probably uh, less efficient than the private sector. But at the same time, sometimes just the process drives the outcome. And, and, and uh, the result is, uh, is, is negative for taxpayers and for the people we're trying to help. Um, let me start uh, with our former majority leader. Mr. Army, what do you think? Uh, Mr. Army also has a Ph.D. in economics. Uh, he actually had a career before he got into politics and uh, a, a lot of knowledge on these issues. How do we translate the, the promise of GIPRA to the appropriations and the tax writing committees where it can really have clout? And that's where the big dollars are, it seems to me. And, and politically, how do you get through this maze of interest groups and local constituencies and so on that kind of weigh the other way in the process? Any idea? Well, well, let me, I appreciate you asking me that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
And I want to uh, uh, appreciate what uh, Ms. McGinnis and Mr. Walker said regarding our committees because it was a terrible frustration <coughs> with me. And if I can, again, take a moment to remember with fondness Virginia Thomas, bless her heart. Virginia Thomas was a member of my staff who I dedicated to this task. And uh, basically, Virginia and I, what we tried to do is create a symbiosis between the uh, authorizers and the appropriators with this committee and its jurisdiction as sort of a foundation uh, on the whole question of, of oversight. I look back on the now 10 years, almost 10 years of the Republican majority, and if there's a skill set that this Republican majority has not yet obtained well, it's oversight. Uh, I have to say, by the time I got here, the Democrats were in their 30th year of their majority, uninterrupted majority, and, and as I said earlier, Jack Brooks was my first person to ob observe. Uh, and they had developed an oversight skill set. I would say that between Jack Brooks and John Dingell, it was perfected, perfected to the terror of agency heads that were called before their committees. Well, it, oversight doesn't have to be a terrifying process, but it should be a rigorous process. The appropriators seem to have fairly good skills on oversight, but they target their oversight more or less at the money and at appropriators, what should I say, focused attention, sometimes parochial. But when, they, when the appropriators do oversight, they achieve a level of rigor and thoroughness. I just don't think they've ever really gotten a spirit of seeing how they could coordinate their oversight leverage, which is, of course, the power of the purse, to our efforts to implement the Results Act. And I think that can be encouraged. We tried to encourage that. The authorizing committees, for the most part, I believe in this body have never achieved a very high level of skill in oversight, nor do I think they've devoted much attention or interest in it as a general rule. When, uh, when we tried to encourage greater interest, it was the authorizers Basically, the effort that I got, and I remember one very sensational meeting with somebody singing the song Devil with a Blue Dress on to Virginia Thomas, who I believe never wore a blue dress to a meeting again after that, because uh, quite frankly, she was a woman of a fairly assertive personality as well. She should have been in that instance, and it was met with some uh, unkind resistance. Well, let me ask a question. If I, uh, if I, may, if I, if I may, yeah, sure. My yeah, okay. The appropriator's uh, attitude was, "We know how to do oversight, and we do it better than anybody else around here. So, <laughs> we, we we need no encouragement no, nor any instruction." The authorizers basically said, "That's not our business. We don't do that." And that has been the problem we fought. Now, I'm sorry. No, I, I think one of the difficulties has been that you get a popular program up, uh, and Ms. McGinnis talked about the D.A.R.E. program, but it's everything from student loans to lunches and everything else, and there are studies that show maybe it's not the most efficient way to deliver it. Mm -hmm. Members are asked to look at, we just had a big vote on Head Start, and I don't want to get into the politics mm -hmm. of that in terms of maybe doing it a little more efficiently, and all of a sudden members end up getting targeted by groups with interest in the program even though there may be a more efficient way to deliver, and it becomes political hot potatoes. I mean, it is, this is very, uh, on members, this puts a lot of pressure ch to, to change things because every program, once it's passed, it gets a constituency. That's why there's nothing closer to eternal life than a government program. Once it's created, you get the constituencies, and you start changes, and I saw it in my first uh, uh, reelect. Uh, they're saying Davis voted against this and he against that. I, didn't, I just voted for a different way to do it based on some studies. But there's a huge reluctance, a big inertia factor. I see Mr. Walker with his hand up. Mr. Chairman, several of us talked about the issue of cultural transformation. That's really what we're talking about here. I mean, we're talking about a cultural transformation on Capitol Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. The executive branch realistically is going to be ahead of the legislative branch on cultural transformations because you have one chief executive. Mm -hmm. uh, you now have the president's management agenda. You now have the program assessment rating tool and things that are focused on this. Uh, there needs to be a cultural transformation 
uh, in the legislative branch. Candidly, my experience in both the public sector, having run two executive branch agencies and now GAO, and, and having run several uh, lines of business in the private sector, is before you can have a cultural transformation, you have to have the affected parties recognize that we're on a burning platform, not literally, but figuratively, that the status quo is unacceptable, the status quo is unsustainable. In that regard, yesterday I gave a speech to the National Press Club talking about changes and challenges. We are on a burning platform. We have to make tough choices, and uh, I will provide a copy of you, you know, for your information, and if you think it's worthwhile to put it in the record for this hearing, but the fact of the matter is, these various parties have to be convinced that the status quo is unacceptable, <coughs> we're on an unsustainable path. <coughs> if that can be done, believe me, this is a val very valuable tool that can be used to try to help make informed judgments in this regard. Well, let me make a comment and get a reaction from all of you. I mean, a lot of the innovation we see in state and local governments, I mean, these are your laboratories of democracy, but they run on balanced budgets. And so they are forced to make changes sometimes in the way they deliver programs because they have to balance it and they have to either cut a service out altogether or figure out a new, more efficient way to do it. Sometimes we don't face the same pressure here. We just print more money and go keep going on and doing it. And is that, is that a, probably one of the differences we see and how do you instill that discipline? Well, it is. I mean, the fact of the matter is we don't have a balance budget requirement. Whether we should or not, reasonable people can differ. We right. don't have a rating on our debt. We don't have a stock price. Uh, so this is a valuable mechanism to be able to demonstrate what kind of resources are people getting, what kind of results are they generating, but we have a big gap that we've got to close and we need to use every tool that we can get to help make informed judgments on how to okay. close it. Let and me may, ask, I, and may I just also go. add, a very big component is courage. The fact of the matter is Congress has in the past created things that have become political sacred cows. I can remember sitting in the Education Committee years ago and marveling at uh, then Congressman Tom Talkey's courage <clears throat> in saying, we ought to measure what real results we're getting from Head Start. And I really expected to see the ceiling come down on the poor man. But the fact that he dared to say, we ought to have an objective measure of the real results of a sacred cow was a source of quite a bit of encouragement. I was fully aware that Tom Talkey, being from the more moderate wing of our party, had more license to say that than I did. Uh, had I said it, the roof would have come down. But Tom at least was, was able to pose the question. Now, once the question is posed, then people must step forward and say, you can't expect the agency to take that initiative and they don't have the responsibility to the public interest that the elected official has. And until we can obtain the courage out of members of Congress, we will not get of objective me measures of programs, perhaps of long st standing hmm. and large costs that really do not indeed deliver the results. Does Head Start do that? I don't know. I know that one time I heard Tom Talkey ask a question. I'm not sure I ever heard it asked since but I doubt that the measurement's ever taken place. Well, actually, we had a huge uh, vote on revamping it this year that Mike Castle led the way, and, uh, but mm -hmm. very close, like you say, a lot of issues, and we could stand here today. I'm sure there are different perspectives on the, on the committee, but uh, it is continued to be uh, uh, looked at, not in terms of cutting uh, help to the people we're, that we're trying to help, but in the best way to deliver it. Mr. Johnson. I was going to say, one of the things perhaps that the executive branch, but also Congress needs to um, uh, come to understand is that performance information is not to be feared. Mm -hmm. uh, I know when we first started uh, talking about the part, uh, there was concern in the agencies that, oh, a, a low part score means funding gets cut and a high part score means funding gets increased. Uh, a bad performance score for a program, Head Start or adult literacy or or a defense program, or whatever, does not, should not mean that funding automatically gets drop, gets lowered or, or the program gets dropped. It should mean that we should stop and ask ourselves what was planned, what was intended, what's the definition of success, or how, how successful are we if we aren't as successful as we intended when we passed the law, what can we do different? How can we manage it differently? How, maybe we need to restructure it. Maybe we're spending too much money, maybe we're spending not enough money, maybe we need to combine it with this or that. 
But, it, but asking the question, is it working? Is Head Start working? Are adult literacy programs working? Um, is not to be feared. Adult literacy programs do not work. I think we like the notion of literate adults. I think that's something that's a business so-called we want to be in. They don't work. So the goal is not to get out of that business. We need to figure out how to better structure programs to help illiterate adults become literate. And it starts with an understanding and a belief that performance information, there's nothing automatic about observing or measuring and concluding that something does or does not work. The key is what's the so what of it? What's the next step that takes place as a result of knowing that? Let me ask uh, one other question before I turn the question to Mr. Platts. Um, <clears throat> it's been suggested by a couple of the other speakers that maybe instead of a three-year or five-year performance, we do four years so it coincides with each, each administration. But you were head of presidential personnel before you right. went to OMB. My experience is it usually takes an administration a year just to get up and running to get things going. I mean, that's right. the, you, you, as you said, you, we campaign in, in poetry, but translating this into prose, uh, it takes a year to get your people in place, right. to get the programs in place. The administration is really now up and running on these issues. But for the first couple of years, you're just, uh, uh, you're, you're coming in trying to understand everything that's going on and get people in place. Is right. it, is, I mean, I wonder if you and Ms. McGinnis could talk about that because I, that's my, uh, uh, th that's one of the concerns I have with trying to coincide with four years. We have the same problem with our governors in Virginia that uh, on the budget, so. What, what if yeah, I please. could just say to start, what I was suggesting was having a four-year cycle that would begin the year after. Oh, so you give them a year to get up. Okay. You, you would give that first full year so that this would begin with the first full budget that the administration proposed, not one month after taking yeah, okay. office. But, right, but, but again, those strategic plans are agency-wide. And ha to ask the question, how is the Interior Department performing? How is housing, HUD, performing? That's almost akin to asking how long is a piece of string? I mean, it's, it, well, what part of HUD or what part of Interior? And that's one of the things, reason we're suggesting that that the bulk of the conversation be about individual programs or like programs or types of programs because you're talking about something with a much more specific, ideally, much more sp specific target measure of performance and the conversation be much more targeted and much more focused on the so what of it, what we, might we do if it's working well or not working well. Right, and, and even a department could be implementing a program well and right, right to the letter of the law and the audits look great but the results Right. Or, uh, uh, right. I, I understand. Mr. Walker, and then I'm going to turn it to Mr. Platts. Uh, go ahead, Mr. As Walker. you probably recall, Mr. Chairman, the GAO does a strategic plan in consultation with the Congress. And what we do is similar to what the recommendation is of Ms. McGinnis, is we end up updating our plan and publishing it uh, a year after there's a new Congress. Uh, and the reason being because there may or may not be a change of control, but even if there isn't a change of control, now you have term limits on committee chairs, uh, and as a result, there can be some changes in key players, even if there isn't a change in control. And so I think the concept of saying, you know, give, give the Congress, give the administration, give the new players a year uh, has a lot of merit. And I think every four years, I think, has merit as well for the executive branch. May I make one final point, uh, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. or at least? There is what I have always thought to be a companion piece to GIPRA called the Congressional Review Act. And I think perhaps you might take a lead uh, to encourage uh, through the leadership that the authorizing committees avail themselves of that oversight instrument. And uh, this gives them a real stake in the claim. And, and as I understand it, it goes like this. We wrote the law. It got signed by the president. It got put within the responsibility of your agency. And now we have a duty and an interest in seeing that your implementation of the law is consistent with our intent of the law. This is a very important oversight activity. My, my guess is as you can encourage the authorizers to be more involved in the business of oversight, they'll be more willing to complement your activities. And the best way to encourage them to be more involved in the business of oversight is to 
encourage them to be involved in their own interests, reviewing the implementation of the laws that they themselves created. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, first, I, I'd like to thank you for holding the hearing and, and uh, with Mother Nature, unfortunately, not cooperating with us to uh, allow a, a broader membership here. But it's great for you and me because we get as many questions as we want. <laughs> You're right. We get more time. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have an open statement I'll submit for the record. And, Without uh, objection. I apologize for my, uh, my late arrival. I also want to thank all of our panelists for your, your being here with us today uh, and for your work past and present um, on behalf of our, our fellow citizens. Um, I guess where I'd like to start, and, and uh, maybe a, a question for, for each of our witnesses. The, um, the GIPRA, as we mark the 10 year, kind of set the, the big picture, and, and very importantly, that we start looking at performance. And to its great credit, and, and it goes to the issue that, uh, Mr. Walker, you, you uh, addressed the cultural transformation. This administration under President Bush is, is trying to have cultural transformation, in my opinion, in taking GIPRA and its big picture outlook and, and then how to take that to the next level down into the program evaluations with, with PART. One of the challenges, though, is going to be for, for PART to have any meaningful impact long term is that we build every year on a base of knowledge. And, and, and you know, this year's appropriations and, and the 20 percent that are evaluated, we have that. And, and next year we see what happen in response to those evaluations being done for the um, part in the management agenda or a, an executive action. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make that um, level of GIPRA now become permanent uh, and ch is it uh, necessary that we look at codifying, codifying um, part as an extension of GIPRA so that we get into that program evaluation permanently, uh, not um, simply because we have an administration today that's making it a priority to look at actual performance of programs. And Mr. Leader, maybe we start with you and we'll, well go across. Well, yeah, it's very difficult. We've talked about that a great deal. What I had always hoped for during the eight years that I was privileged to be majority leader is that we would have a unified leadership position. Now, ideally, if you could have that unity through the major leadership offices, speaker on one side with all of the leadership offices of his caucus and the minority leader with all the leadership offices of their caucus. I think I'm thinking, for example, that Steny Hoyer is a person who might relate very well to this with so many agency people in his district. If you could get a unified leadership uh, commitment to effective and thorough oversight, which I, I'm sorry to say I never was able to muster in my, my eight years, then I think you could encourage, because to a large extent you're trying to affect a cultural change with the committees and the chairman. And uh, the only instrument I know by which that can be done would be the effect of this kind of a unit, unified thing. Uh, your chairman of this committee is a very popular uh, person. It's very like very possible, Mr. Davis, that perhaps you could broker that kind of a unified commitment. Uh, you being a man of far more considerable tact and charm than I exhibited in my efforts, <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would expect you might have better luck. I might also say, though, cultural change does pl take place and there's a symbiosis of ideas. And just as a thought of encouragement, uh, Mr. Platts, I was sitting here thinking about your tenure here in Congress. You very likely have very rarely heard the expression continuing services baseline budget. Uh, for the first 10 years I was in Congress, all budgets started on that basis. And the, the tacit <coughs> implication was we want to make sure we can do next year exactly what we did last year. And that message just started to permeate people's attitudes. Well. What GIPRA is about is let's see if we can do something different and better than we did last year. And now, frankly, we don't budget with that language anymore, and I'm not sure we budget with that spirit anymore. There's probably a continuing services baseline hangover in the budget process, but it is not the governing 
conceptual framework. So change does take place. The more people that represent its advocacy, are the cheerleaders for it, especially people in high places, uh, the quicker it'll happen. But I do believe this committee can encourage the other committees. I mean, I know this, during, even during the eight years that, that I was here, this committee, I think, kind of got off the oversight track, got onto more sensational tracks, and generally speaking, Republicans got bloody noses in every effort they ever made. And there became a sense that oversight is not fun and it is dangerous. And other people developed an aversion to it. Maybe this committee can demonstrate, uh, as I think Steve did, uh, Steve demonstrated to a lot of members that you can be recognized and you can be appreciated and you can have success in oversight and it can be fun. Steve Horn, I think, is a good example for all of us. But this committee can be that good example for the other committees. And, and before we move on, I, uh, Mr. Leader, I, I appreciate and share that perspective and, and as one is given the privilege of succeeding Mr. Horn as chair of the Government Efficiency um, Subcommittee. Um, when we've had our oversight hearings and, and, you know, with various agencies and had a very good dialogue between agencies and GAO and, and, uh, and the personnel there and our committee, one of the things I try to emphasize is this isn't a gotcha um, uh, committee approach. We're not looking to, you know, um, generate headlines. We're looking just to have a, a good communication so, you know, the legislative branch, the executive branch are important. Uh, GAO officials mm -hmm. in their work helping both of us um, work as a team. At the end of the day, we really are not just spending money because that's the way we spent it for the last 20 years, but we're spending money because it's really benefiting uh, the people of our nation as uh, it should, given it's their money and, and we should be uh, responsible. Mr. Johnson? Is, is, is your question how, what things we might do to well, yes, bring into effect and, this and thing? Specifically, uh, is to take what you know, the administration is currently doing and, and I have some other questions to get into how that's working in specific, but um, with one who, as one who believes part is a very positive step, mm -hmm. uh, how do we make sure it's a, a permanently a positive step as opposed to just this administration? And so it, should, we, should we legislate it as an extension of GIPRA or is there uh, other things we should look at? Yeah, I think we do need to look for ways to institutionalize um, uh, results orientation, and, and I don't know whether it requires legislation or executive orders uh, or what it takes in terms of the process. I think we can make demand, the executive branch can make a demands on itself and the things we look at and, and things we provide to you, or you could uh, take action, things you require of us. Uh, I know one of the things we have to do, and Robert Shea and I used to work with, um, work up here in the House and the Senate on government affairs, and uh, it talked about how we can uh, work with members of, of Congress to think through how if performance information can be used, um, and perhaps one of the things we need to be more we need more need more need to be more aggressive about is let's take some real programs or some sample programs and a variety of different performance scenarios. We don't know how it works. We do know how it works, and it's great. We do know how it works, and it's bad high-profile programs, low-profile programs. Maybe it ought to be hypothetical to remove some of particular sensitivities to it and sit down maybe with staffs initially and talk through, okay, in this situation, what, 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 would, what would Congress's approach be? What, would, what kind of uh, open to, openness to attacks do they face? What kind of, uh, from their constituents, if they consider changes? What things should the executive branch be doing? What, what, kind of performance changes should be considering, what kind of budgetary change, appropriation changes should be considering, and kind of game these things out to develop an understanding of when, if and when we had a lot of performance information, how might it be used, and where do we run into political problems, where do we run into getting it done problems, where do we run into labor problems, um, and, and then get to a larger, larger and larger audience, go to elected members and work it through with them, and so we think through as opposed to here's performance, live with it. Because uh, I'm not sure that we know how to do that. I'm not, not sure we know in the executive branch how to do that. If we had performance, detailed performance information on every program, 
I'm not sure we're equipped and have a, a, a um, the processes in place to really effectively react to that kind of information. And I'll bet the same thing is true of Congress. So maybe we game it out and practice it and think through what the implications are on a small scale before we decide to do it broadly. I think that's why Mitch Daniels and Sean O'Keefe originally developed the part and conceived of doing this over a five-year period. I think we're very wise. This is not something you need to rush into. And sometimes the first evaluation of a program is not the best evaluation. And we need to think through how do you really measure success on some of these hard-to-measure programs? And is it really working? And what are some of the implications of the information we get back and the answer to those questions? But then take those and try to work out with Congress what the implications are in terms of how do we ought to work independently of each other and also together. Mm -hmm. Mr. Platts, I would say the, the first thing you ought to do is when you're looking at new legislation, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, why do you need it? Does it already exist in government? Uh, how do you measure success? Uh, and, and try to define those types of things in considering whether or not legislation should be passed and as a critical element of any legislation that is passed. Then secondly, I think what you have to do is you have to recognize, in my opinion, that the federal government today is on an absolute unsustainable path. Uh, and, and, and the base is not okay. Uh, we have an amalgamation of programs, policies, functions, and activities over decades, many of, mit, many of which may have made sense when they were created some of which may still make sense today, others don't, and others may not make sense tomorrow. But because the world has changed dramatically, our position in the world has changed, our fiscal situation is very different. We face the demographic tidal wave that's not going to go away. It's right on the horizon. Tough choices are going to have to get made. Now, in intellectually, I would say that understanding that the, that the primary responsibility ought to be on the executive branch agencies after the law is enacted. They need to be given more guidance on what Congress expects, but the primary responsibility has to be in the executive branch agencies. OMB has an important role to play to second guess whether or not the agencies are doing what they should be doing and linking resources to results because the President has to hold them accountable and has to propose budgets. Congress has got to do a lot more in this area because, you know, candidly right now there's little evidence there's little evidence whatsoever that Congress has any meaningful way linked resources to results, uh, you know, uh, to date. Uh, and, and, but, but intellectually, it's a nonpartisan issue to be able to say, you know, um, we are spending a lot of money on this. We've given a lot of authorities. Uh, you know, how are they doing? I mean, uh, is it working? Is it not working? Uh, and to get the facts, reasonable people can differ on, on, uh, on those facts. but you got to have the facts before you can have, you know, an honest intellectual argument. But tough choices are going to have to be made by this Congress and by more than just this committee. And, and this is, can be a valuable tool, a valuable mechanism to try to help them to make them in a more timely and a more inf uh, inf on, on a more informed basis. Mr. McGinnis. Congressman, I, I do think um, that there should be a more explicit and permanent connection uh, between the use of performance information, not only performance information, but the results of rigorous evaluation of program approaches, a more explicit connection between that and program design, which is done largely through the authorization process in Congress, the funding of programs by the appropriators, and the management of programs in the executive branch. Um, changing the GIPRA statute could contribute to that, but as I suggested in my testimony, I think it may require some rule changes in the Congress in the way the appropriations and authorizations legislation is, is developed. And let me just add that there is a difference between performance information and the results of rigorous evaluation. And let me see if I can give an example of that, uh, because I think the part is very effective in putting the focus on the generation of information about performance and using it in budgeting. But if you're looking at a program, adult literacy is the one that Clay Johnson mentioned, you will, if you look at the uh, performance information, you'll see that this program is not producing the intended results. 
Um, if you also invest in some long-term evaluation of different approaches um, with a control group and looking at an approach, you can begin to see what approaches under the label of adult literacy actually work. So you need, we need both. And uh, the fact of the matter is, in addition to making that connection more permanent and more explicit, we need a larger investment in evaluation. I mean, even in the part process, if you look at it closely, you'll see that the data doesn't exist in a lot of cases. Or you can't, you know, you, it's, it's, uh, you can't assess performance given what we have now. So that's, that's another issue that needs to be taken up. It, it sounds like um, certainly agreement on part and the benefit and, and the process, the direction we're heading, but perhaps uh, we're, we're premature as to whether we should codify part in GIPRA in the sense of this being first 20 percent and how we're actually going to use part because of the uh, maybe the concern that GIPRA is a paperwork exercise, but we're not really using GIPRA as effectively, you know, today as we could be. And, and Perhaps our focus should be to really get more into what GIPRA allows us to do and, and um, you know, not necessarily move forward with just creating a new law that makes it look like we're doing more, but maybe we're really not using the tools we already have. Mr. Walker, do you have a uh, You may not have been here when, when I spoke before saying, other than this committee and Senate Governmental Affairs, there's not much activity in using the information that's already there. The executive branch is on the case. Some agencies are doing better than others. The administration is taking this very seriously through the President's Management Agenda and the part. The real work that needs to be done, quite frankly, is the Congress has got to come up the curve. The Congress has got a long way to go to coming up the curve on this issue. And it's a nonpartisan issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it really doesn't make any difference what party is in charge. It, yeah, okay. I, I mean, sure. Me, sure. Let, you would yield just one second. Yeah. Let me, that's yeah. a pretty brave statement for a, a man who reports to Congress and not the administration. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, if I may, I'd like to second that, and okay. I'd like to re or, or, again remember this. Since you don't have to run for leader anymore, you that's can right. say whatever you want. <laughs> I can. <laughs> but, but if I may, and I go back, this legislation was created in 1993 with a Democrat Congress and a Democrat President. There is no partisan purpose here. And it is something we ought to be able to put partisanship aside. If, if the goals and the objectives of, uh, of legislation are heartfelt and, and precious, like Head Start, all the more a responsible Congress would take on the responsibilities of seeing to it that we get every bit of value for our dollar committed to that program. And all, all the more remiss we are if we do not do the appropriate oversight. Well, and, and I think, it, it, Mr. Leader, you capture what Mr. Walker was touching on at, when we create a new program, and it, I think it goes hand in hand with reauthorizing or refunding existing programs. And I, I forget um, the gentleman from New Zealand, the, um, uh, Mr. McTeague, uh, that we had before our subcommittee, and he talked from his own experience um, in, you know, uh, legislative work in New Zealand. Um, and he asks the same questions that he has a list of questions that he goes through and whether uh, you know you should even begin a program and and I think so often what our focus is whether it's head start and preschool or early ed issues whether it's literacy is our focus here in Congress becomes the program instead of the service we're trying to provide and and that gets to his comments and Mr. Walker yours today that our focus really is, all right, we, we can agree with what we want to do is do right by using Head Start, uh, you know, needy in, uh, uh, children who are, you know, not getting the, uh, the benefits that we're going to make sure they're, a, you know, the, the best citizen they can be, um, whether it be reading, whether it be um, other social service needs. Um, but our focus is, is on that program that already exists as opposed to is there a better way, maybe there isn't. So, but we need to, you know, then focus how to make that program best. But you're right. I think Congress is, you know, my short time here, uh, coming on three years. Our, our focus is on the existing programs, not is there a better way, but what to do with this program. I, I do have a follow-up, um, Ms. McGinnis, on, on your suggestion um, regarding perhaps uh, role changes in Congress. Is one that you envision, and, and my 
appropriate or friends you know, cringe when I make this suggestion, if this is what you meant by that, was the um, example of unauthorized appropriations, that, so that something that's not been worked its way through an authorizing committee and through the you know, process that just gets right into the appropriations bill and is, is funding something that's really not had the additional scrutiny. Is that the type of rule change that you envision? Um, that, actually, that was not one that I addressed, although that's, a, that's, that's an important issue. What I had suggested was that, um, that every appropriation act have to, appro have to um, set out the specific use of goals and performance data in coming up with the funding and identify gaps in that data so that you, you basically are, are changing the practice of using performance information in making funding decisions and explaining how it's been used. Um, the same thing with authorizers in the design of programs. Mm -hmm. um, but having this process be more connected to actual results and the promise of results is really, I think, a, a theme that we're all hitting on, and it really gets to the um, accountability and lack of trust of the American people in their government, fundamentally. I have some follow-up, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Um, go ahead, uh, Mr. Johnson. Oh. Go, you can one, go ahead and, and you ask sure? if you're sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just one comment. Um, you refer to do we need a, a bill or do we need some statute or something to codify this? I don't think we need any bills or legislation to, to institutionalize any of this yet. Uh, we're only the second year of evaluating right. specific programs. So we're only in the first year of following up on the so what of it. This program works, it doesn't work, what are we doing about it? Um, it strikes me that uh, what the responsibility should be in the executive branch to take performance information that we have now from the 40% of the programs uh, that have been evaluated and use that information to inform our recommendations to Congress, budget recommendations. In other words, the responsibility should be ours to take that and to base as much, many of our decisions or many of our recommendations as possible on based on whether the program works or not. And other, there are other political considerations and opportunities and so forth, but make sure that we are referencing performance information at every turn. But then it's also, then the responsibility would pass to Congress to actually pay attention to it. A lot of what we hear now is don't even bother to send us that performance information or send it to us in a separate document and um, if you want, if you need to. Um, somehow, again, this is Congress, we're executive branch. I'm very brave of David to um, right. make these comments about Congress uh, better P than I. Um, <laughs> but um, Congress has to, one, be willing to pay attention to that. And there's no automatic, if this is the performance, if this is the assessment, we automatically do this. There is no mat automatic anything. It is an indicator, but they have to be open to at least consider the potential relevance of performance information. And they are not now. And so if we do our part, then Congress needs to be challenged to do their part. Mr. Johnson, that, that kind of leads me to, to my next question, which is, the relationship and, and how the interactions occur between OMB and the agencies regarding the program evaluations and taking the, 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 you know, the first 20 percent where we had a little over 50 percent or just over 50 percent saying, you know, that their results not demonstrated. I mean, the, the, it wasn't a good picture. Um, so with those uh, 100 and, or I guess 234 programs specifically, what is OMB doing in response to that information? now going into the next year, yeah. um, and, and how's that refining perhaps uh, your next 20 percent in each stage? Yeah. Um, for the programs for which there are, it's, it's not clear whether there's good performance or not. They're looking for performance measures. Some of these things are very hard to measure, and no, it never dawned on anybody when some of these programs were created that anybody would care whether they worked or not. Um, so, but how do you measure things like, it, are, is, are we doing a good job of, uh, managing um, um, the drug situation in the United States or adult literacy or some of these things are very complicated. So we're looking for spending more time paying attention to how do you measure performance, how do you measure success. And then 
we're paying more attention to what is the quality and the aggressiveness of the follow-up on the recommended next steps that came out of that. So we're in the first year of that follow-up and we're working with agencies to make sure there's a process in place in each of the agencies that they, they, we've invested the time to assess whether the program works or not. We decided that the recommended course of action in light of our assessment is to change this, to, to combine it with that, to drop this, to more funding, less funding, to look for better performance measures. Okay, that was nine months ago or 12 months ago. Where are we? What's, what's the quality and the aggressiveness of the follow-up? And so how do you oversee that? Well, it's a flow of information and it's who's accountable for it and who's responsible for it and so forth. And we're in the process now of trying to establish those, those processes with the agencies. Uh, we also have learned more about the quality of the assessment. We've gone back and analyzed pat, past uh, part uh, ratings and determined that there is some inconsistency with some of the ratings. And so we're trying to make the OMB examiners and the people in the agencies better at more uniformly and consistently evaluating these programs. So we're trying to make sure that the quality assessment is better and we're trying to make sure that the quality and the aggressiveness of the follow-up is there. Because if there is no so what, if there is no aggressive and high quality follow-up by Congress and by us, this is a waste of time. Absolutely, and that, that's uh, the, um, certainly would be uh, what, we, what we don't want, that we spend even more money and more time but don't right. get any results right. from that oversight responsibility and, it, yeah. and uh, it's a problem from that we're trying to prevent in the first place what, what's with with the each stage coming uh, you know the the next round the 20 percent over five years are the the agencies and I, I um, may have asked this in one of our previous subcommittee hearings I don't remember the, if I did and, and certainly uh, I'm not believing I, it was a, a clear answer that the, the the ones that are in the like the last round fifth year or fourth year um, are they being told today, um, you know, yeah, you're three years out or four years out. Um, why so, wait? Yeah, well, right. Why wait? And, and so that we don't have 50 percent that you really can assess right. the results. So they, they do have, uh, you know, more time to, to be mm -hmm. ready for that assessment. So we shouldn't have 50.4 percent in that fifth round and hopefully yeah. not in the fourth, third yeah. you know, round. Where, where's that process yeah, stand? That's a very good point. I don't think we are formally suggesting that agencies do that. I have been met with leadership in all agencies, and I've heard individual agencies say, you know, we're not waiting. We know that our program uh, is in that fifth tranche, and, right. uh, but we're not waiting. We're going through sort of, a, uh, sort of a, an informal part assessment to see where we are and see when we do finally uh, go through this formally that we'll be better prepared for that. But I think that's a good idea, and we need to be more formal working with the agencies to encourage them to do that. Some of these, when we say we're at 40 percent evaluating all the programs, uh, that's not a uniform 40 percent. Uh, one agency has evaluated 80 percent of the pro eight programs that account for 80 percent of their spending, and others at 60 percent. One of the things we're giving some serious thought to is uh, taking that program, that agency, and completing the part assessment of all 100 percent of the programs. So we have one or two or three agencies that are 100 percent parted, all right, how do you run an agency where you have program and, and, and performance of information on everything they do? How does that agency function differently? What kind of conversations do they have, different conversations do they have with themselves on a weekly and a monthly basis? What's their interaction with Congress? Right now it's, it's a little bit in between because we've got, you know, 20 percent of the programs or 40 percent of the programs or whatever, and so there's no one consistent approach to it. But let's take some agencies, get them all the way across the finish line and see how that ought to operate so they can report back to the other agencies and this is what you're heading towards. A, a more a comprehensive cultural change so that, right. that agency in total is, you know, operating in a new fashion with right. more scrutiny and, and focus on results. Mr. Walker, with GAO's role, uh, is there a um, need for an enhanced role of GAO in evaluating the, the, the part uh, process and the actual evaluations that are completed um, in a more uh, formal fashion? Well, I think it's important that OMB continue to do what it's doing. And as I said before, I think the agencies have the primary responsibility, frankly, to make sure that they're delivering results with the resources and authorities they're getting. I mean, the, the, not only the Congress should demand it, but the, the taxpayers ought to demand it. I do, however, also believe that we have to recognize there's a separation of powers issue. And while it's good that OMB is doing this, and I commend them for it and think they should continue to do it, 
It will evolve over time. I think it's important that the legislative branch use GAO uh, to be able to analyze uh, what they're doing uh, and also to periodically look at particular programs or departments or agencies or to look at particular functional activities that cross a number of department and agencies as a supplement to, not a substitute for, uh, what the executive branch mm -hmm. is doing. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Um, thank you very much. Let me just throw a kind of a final query to the panel. Um, everyone, I think, here agrees it's a great concept. Uh, I think uh, executive branch probably doing a better job than the legislative branch right now. Are there any teeth uh, legislatively we could put in this that would help the legislative branch improve our job, or is it just a question of leadership? If I may. Sure, please, Ms. Rami. I think, you know, I walk around the country and something happens. And first thing you hear is there ought to be a law. That's the first thing the congressman hears, too. So he gets busy writing a new law. I wish somebody would stand on Main Street and say, there ought to be better oversight. And that the congressman could get there. Now, I, I go by Steve Horn's one of the few people that actually made a place in the sun for himself. He got recognized and appreciated for his oversight work. It's, it's hard work, and it's not well recognized. You know, you're not going to see the uh, Washington Post down here covering oversight hearings. I, I spent the first couple of years when we were, as majority leader, frustrated because even this committee could get all the press in the world if it was wallowing around in a scandal. Everybody was down here with their notepads and their cameras, right? Well, that wasn't really, frankly, very productive towards the better performance of our agencies of government in the implementing the law for the future and safety and security of our children. It was probably better theater and more entertaining, but it was a diversion even of this committee. Now this committee, uh, with the current circumstances and the current leadership, has an opportunity to demonstrate to other members of Congress there are rewards and recognitions in effective oversight. Uh, the fact of the matter is, as they see that, they will be. I think virtually every authorizing committee has an oversight subcommittee. I believe for the most part they lie fa fallow. Uh, uh, because again, we're not getting uh, the kind of uh, recognition that congressmen want to have for their activities. I think, uh, you know, again, I've said, I said before, I can do my children more good through effective oversight than I can by writing another law. But I'm not going to get any personal recognition for the oversight, so I go write the law. And, uh, and maybe, Mr. Chairman, It's like we said, we campaign in poetry and we govern in prose, and it's just I think, uh, if I might, Oversight, the business of oversight, needs its rock star. Mr. Chairman, I think you can be that rock star. I think you ought to do your best Bono imitation and <laughs> demonstrate to the members of Congress that uh, you can be successful. A and I hope, I, my, I would hope that somebody in the media would understand the critical importance of this business, how hard the work is, and help set an example for others that uh, that's what good government's about, the hard rigor of oversight. Uh, the agencies, perhaps if you take an agency and pull it all the way through the gauntlet, it can come out on the other end and say, hey, I ran the gauntlet and I'm a better a agency for it, it can be an encouragement to other agencies. Maybe, the, maybe that is an approach that should be taken, to focus in on one agency and say, we're going to give you the opportunity of a lifetime. You're going to be the first best example of success to shine in front of the other agencies. Uh, we need a volunteer. Yeah, right. 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 I started yeah. running for the corners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, may I say, as a, what, what may well be my final words, thank you for this, the work of this committee. Uh, it, it, those of you who come to this committee, stay on this committee, assume positions of leadership in this committee, and do the work uh, seriously, I think can be an example before your colleagues 
each and every committee of Congress can perform an important oversight uh, process and all should be encouraged to do so. I can think of no quicker, uh, more effective source of that encouragement than your committee's success. So I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you very much. Anyone else, uh, Mr. Walker? Ms. Wright, good. A few quick comments. First, to reinforce, um, we're on a burning platform, figuratively, not literally. Status quo is unacceptable, unsustainable. Tough choices are going to have to be made. To make those tough choices, one of the things that's going to have to happen is Congress is going to have to be more engaged with regard to oversight, uh, authorization, and appropriations activities. Like anything, you need a few champions. You don't need many. You need a few. You know, if you, even if you have a couple on each side of the aisle, uh, if it's important enough, that can get the job done. I think back, I was Assistant Secretary of Labor for, uh, during the Reagan administration and early Bush, for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. There were two Democrats and two Republicans, uh, you know, uh, one Republican, one Democrat in the House, one Republican, one Democrat in the Senate, who labored for uh, several years to get that passed. It got done. It had a tremendous impact on tens of millions of Americans, our economy, et cetera. Um, this committee and Senate Governmental Affairs are the ones to get it done. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is, is that uh, this committee and Senate Governmental Affairs also have a strategic ally on this important nonpartisan issue, and that's GAO. We are a strategic asset to this committee, to the Congress and the country, and we look forward to doing our part. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I have a suggestion. Um, clearly, you can't legislate leadership, and you can't legislate culture change, um, but it occurs to me that the, the, cha the potential champions, and some of them right now might be resistors, um, in the leadership of the Appropriations Committee and some of the major authorization and tax committees um, should come together, perhaps in a very bipartisan way, House and Senate, with some key people in the executive branch, and really have this conversation about performance and results and um, accountability to the public for a return on the tax investment. Um, the, as you know, the Council for Excellence in Government, among many other things, organizes the bipartisan House retreat. And it strikes me that bringing together a much smaller group around an issue as significant as this in that kind of an honest conversation could be very constructive to build some interest and in ownership uh, that might lead to both changes in practice, uh, changes in rules, and changes in legislation. Okay, and we would you. be delighted to work with you on that if, if right. you're interested. Thank you very much. Well, let me thank this panel. This is, I think we had a great discussion today. Uh, uh, I'd say, gee, we have some great ideas for legislation, but uh, I think Mr. Army uh, knows we have more opportunities for oversight. So I will emphasize that as a result of this. Take this back. Uh, actually, we may have a couple pieces of legislation come out of this, but uh, this has been very, very helpful to us. And, and although we had a, a small panel as uh, members who have uh, fleed the jurisdiction with the coming hurricane, I think it allowed for a sustained discussion, something we often don't get in these hearings. This will obviously be shared with other members and Mr. Platt's subcommittee will hold further hearings on this and basically has uh, is employed to uh, uh, further any additional legislative changes and recommendations. So we'll see some of you there. Yeah, Mr. Walker. Real quickly for the record, Mr. Chairman, as you know, this committee, and, and I believe it's Senate Governmental Affairs, has asked us to do a comprehensive assessment of GIPRA and the 10-year anniversary. We're going to be issuing a report next month Excellent. Uh, on this, and it will have a number of recommendations. We look forward to following up on that. That's great. We look forward I to I encourage that. you to tone down some of that talk about Congress. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've Speaking the truth to power is tough sometimes. Well, you know, I saw Mr. Walker gave the executive branch a B or better, and uh, I didn't ask him to rate the legislative branch. I understand where his job comes from and where he's reporting from, so, uh, but we get the message. Uh, and we appreciate very much everyone's comments today. I think they've added greatly to the discussion. And uh, we will adjourn the hearing. Thank you very much. All right.
sign up if you don't want to play C SPAN, Saturday night. American Perspective starts at 8 with an examination of religion and cultural values in America with talk radio host Janet Parshall. Barry Lynn, Executive Director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State.